thank you organizing team for giving me this opportunity so i'll be moderating the second examination based session so for this i would like to uh, invite my presenters uh, first dr venkatesh k he is dm medical student at tata dr harsh shahu he is also medical oncologist at uh, doing his dm medical oncology at tata and now is coming okay so in place of dr harsh dr anna is coming and third is dr gargi she is radiation oncologist at tata and our examination examiners are dr nikhil he is consultant medical oncologist at yashoda cancer institute hyderabad dr asim sama consultant medical oncologist at bhagwan mahavir cancer research center dr ashish bakshi he is a consultant medical oncologist at hiranandani hospital mumbai dr bk smriti ma'am dr uh, she is also consultant medical oncologist at lilavati and bombay hospital dr tarachand gupta he is consultant medical oncologist at bhagwan mahavir cancer center jaipur okay and dr bhavin visarya he is radiation oncologist at scg cancer center mumbai and dr siddharth turkar he is uh, also consultant medical oncologist at raipur so let's begin with the case okay so we'll start with the history yeah. part dr uh, gargi is presenting the history uh, dr anu one second uh, dr uh, siddharth turkar is there instead of dr ashish bakshi yeah okay uh, oh, hello yeah. so here we had a 65 year old lady from west bengal who presented with the chief complaint of uh, left sided weakness in the duration of 20 days uh the weakness was gradual in onset uh, starting with the upper limb and then uh, progressing to the lower limb uh it was realized when she noticed difficulty in raising her arm over head followed a few days later by difficulty in climbing stairs uh so there was no associated decrease sensation no decrease vision only difficulty in facial movements speaking or swallowing there were no involuntary movements and no bladder or bowel complaint uh so the patient did not have any history of similar complaints in the past uh there was no previous history of uh, hypertension or diabetes or arthritis no history of tuberculosis and uh the patient uh sleep and appetite was normal and uh, she had no habits um coming to the general examination uh the patient was conscious well oriented to time place person of february pulse was 88 beats per minute regular bp was 110 mm of mercury respiratory rate was 18 per minute and there was no pallor actress synosis clubbing the pattern of the edema a bmi was 23 uh, sorry 23 and echo was good mm-hmm. coming to the systemic examination it started the cns examination the patient's high mental functions were intact the renal nerves were intact uh there was no limb atrophy no sensory deficit uh there was loss of power in the left upper limb 3 by 5 and left lower limb 4 by 5 uh the respiratory system uh as i said respiratory rate was 18 per minute with no structural deviation air entry was bilaterally equal with no adventitious sounds uh cardiovascular system was also normal and on abdominal examination there was no free fluid or organomegaly bowel sounds were normal yeah that's it first thing is okay so dr gargi can you please summarize regarding the organ involvement and your summary patient summary okay so in 50 words you please summarize uh this is a 55 year old lady with no com- comorbidities who presented with gradual onset left hemiparesis of a duration of 20 days okay so have you taken the history family history or some other illnesses with the lady in previous uh yeah so she did not have any history of uh, hypertension diabetes or tb okay, and no, not no any medication cancer oh uh, yes sir no family history suggestive of cancer in the uh, uh, no sir but at uh, no, this point in history there was nothing to suggest she has any malignancy so okay no. 
so she had only one symptom which is suggesting the upper limb weakness yes. and the power is gradually decreasing it is 3 by 5 now so uh, to this point what is your dd for this kind of the symptom uh, the most likely the motor motor weakness uh, most likely dd would be a cerebrovascular accident or another yeah at this point in time and there was no history of smoking also right Uh, sorry, no sir. history of habits or addiction. No habits. Okay, so Madam, you want to answer? Yeah. So now, how would you go about uh, investigating this patient? Um, I would like to do uh, blood investigations in the form of CBC and biochemistry to mm -hmm. uh, see if any abnormalities. And after that, I would uh, like to image the brain uh, with the MRI. And okay, so. Uh, Do you have the MRI findings? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. So on MRI, uh, we had a, a ring enhancing lesion, one point five into one centimeter in the right frontoparietal lobe with uh, perilesional edema. Uh, also, there was a small uh, uh, hemorrhagic uh, metastatic lesion in the left cerebral uh, hemisphere. So, how would you now go about? Uh, trying to diagnose what this uh, lesions are uh so the uh, the lesion on the mri was uh, reported as metastatic so we would like to look for the primary so i would uh, initially like to further examine the patient uh, since she is a female i would like to do a breast examination uh, followed by a uh, uh, per vaginal and a per rectal examination Uh, if nothing uh, after that uh, depending upon the findings i would like to further uh, image the patient to locate the primary so dr gargi you have uh, mentioned in your physical findings and uh, examination there was nothing suggestive of any abnormality in the physical exam right uh, no okay and whenever you uh, you were asked in the exam like which investigation you will do you just go by the uh, target organ Like here is the MRI, and MRI is better said like contrast enhanced MRI. Yes. You said perilesional edema is there, but you images projected the images, and there is much or not much of the perilesional edema. So was it very significant in your finding or what? Uh, uh, I so uh, so I have uh, put the contrast enhanced images, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, the edema would be better seen on the T two weighted images. So I have not actually put those. For us, uh, all the six images are almost same. See the the section is same from the one level. The only uh, the right side uh, hemisphere has one ring enhancing lesion. Yes. So you can project in one side two three images T one T two and the contrast. Right. Yes. So we'll ask to Dr. Harsh. We'll switch to that. He's the student in the medical oncology. So which investigation you want to do further? She has said like uh, the patient had one or two uh, metastatic lesion in the brain. So how you will proceed for that? And I'll go by doing a systemic imaging. Maybe a PET scan, whole body PET scan to look for the primary site. You will do PET scan. Any other investigation which you want to do? Based on the primary, then we'll go ahead for tissue diagnosis with uh, biopsy from the primary site. We can find out the primary site. You can go ahead with a MR spectroscopy to look for the whether it's a uh primary cns uh before doing pet scan would you like to do anything for the brain with respect to intervention a biopsy or excision because she has presented with a uh hemiplegia first investigation when she presented to to casualty i do an uh, agt to do do not hypoglycemia then I do an agt brain and followed by if there is nothing there then go ahead with an mr uh Apart from that, uh, brain biopsy is itself a risky procedure. If I can find an alternate source for tissue diagnosis, I'll go. I'll try to find out. So, Doctor Venkatesh, is it okay to do first uh, NCCT uh, brain and then MRI and then other investigation, or directly if it is available, you go for the brain MRI? So, in this case scenario, because the patient is having twenty days history, so NCCT brain, I wouldn't have gone sir. I would have gone for MRI, and if they are being showing a lesion, I would have gone for MRI spectroscopy. At least we'll tentatively you can get it's a metastatic or any TB or something tentatively. Then I would go for the T 
imaging if it is ct tap i mean thorax abdomen pelvis even if not, or pet scan probably okay so have you done pet scan ah uh, yes okay what are the images uh, so in pet uh, there was a region in the right upper lobe of the uh, lung measuring about 6.9 into 3.6 cm with a scv max of 38 Round. and also there was a sub centimeter non ftg avid uh, paratracheal node and also the lesion which is seen on mri was corroborated on the uh, pet ct so these are the images of the pet so now the impression is a primary is in the lung yes sir right so venkatesh how you will proceed so uh, now to, uh, now we'll go for uh, ct get biopsy sir. ct guided biopsy any any instruction which you want to give to your intervention radiologist oh, to, uh, to get that more tissue diagnosis more biopsy is more samples more cuts how 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 many cores of the biopsy at least you want 10 to 12 10 to 12 it is very uh, it is it is not prostate it is not other solid tissue it is lung which is situated in the hollow cavity and is very vital organ So maybe three or four cores are suffice, but the length should be optimal, like one or one point five centimeter. So it is okay to have this this much of tissue. So why do you want uh, many cores or more tissue? One is from uh, proper diagnosis, histological diagnosis. Sometimes if there is discrepancy, then one is for driver molecular testing, which is now the more more era towards molecular testing. So uh, in which solution you will take the biopsy tissue? Suppose they have done the biopsy, tissue is in their hand on the gun biopsy, and now they want to order uh, some solution to prevent the preserve that. So, which is that solution? Formalin. So, your molecular test can't be done on the formalin preserved material. So, if you want to do molecular testing, you need to put the tissue in the saline, and if you want to do histopathology, then you should uh, do it in the formalin solution, buffered solution. so apart from histology uh, what other uh, test would you order in this patient what are the molecular tests and which is the whole panel that you would order so first would i would order for egfr all cross and pdl one man the first test which i would like to order then uh, and it being metastatic in effort i'll go for ngs also being metastatic setting so ngs would you go sequentially or uh, you would order ngs right away Probably I'll go for NGS if you have sources to get a rare report right? because patient is stable, not symptomatic much, uh, not symptomatic for the primary point of view. So maybe I can make so he has time. So I'll go for NGS to finance some not issue. Otherwise I'll go for a tire stage staging wise first at least these these four things then followed by later. What is your opinion? We should go sequentially or directly we should order the NGS. If patient is affordable, we can directly go for NGS and PDL one because EGFR, L cross, everything will be covered in that. No need to spend twice. Yeah. What is the benefit of NGS or over over IHC in the sequential tests? NGS is more sensitive. Second, is it will cover wider panel of mutation. It will involve red. Uh, and met another target and mutation will also be covered that may not be seen in uh, by target and IHC or EGFR or something. Apart from the EGFR, L cross, and PDL one, uh, what are the other mutations you are looking for in this patient? Uh, we are looking for uh, met, KRAS, uh, NRAS, VRAF. Uh, what is the lung panel usually constitute? Here for L cross, and then. Bankesh, you will add add this. Uh, I mean, her two sir. I mean, her, in addition to met, uh, red. Yeah, this is a twelve gene panel. Red met. Kiras, yeah, IGFR, Alcross, and R2. PDL. Yeah, and uh, PDL one is by ISC usually. ISC. That is yeah. NGS. So actually, NGS preserves the tissue over the ISC. It consumes the less tissue, so it is easily we can do the test. 
And if we do the sequentially these tests, it takes the time more than the NGS. Usually, NGS report nowadays is available within five working days only. So uh, you have done the histology, and your history report says it is the uh, NSCLC. Yes. Sir. What is your report, sir? Please tell us. Sir, so the patient had a EGFR mutation and exon nineteen deletion. So, what are the other types of the uh, EGFR mutation you know for the clinical practice? Uh, exon 21 point mutation, uh, exon 18 deletion. Um, Which are clinically relevant is three for uh, mutation testing. What are the targets for the EGFR di directed therapies? Exon 19, Exon 21, and other? Yeah, what about Exon 18 and 20? So, Exon 20 T790M, so Exon 90, Exon 21 LA58R, then EGFR uh, 20 insertions, and even some other three rare mutations like uh, S768I, G7122Q, and uh, yeah, Exon 18 also there. Exon 18. So, based on that, so, plan. what is the uh, complete diagnosis of this patient now? Oh, metastatic adenocarcinoma of lung with uh, metastasis in the sites of uh, brain with EGFR exon 19 deletion. So, this is a single lesion in brain. How will you proceed with this patient? First, uh, he is symptomatic for the brain lesions. Sir. So first I will ask my radiotherapy, radiotherapy doctor to go for opinion about an SRS, role of an SRS. Because it's a single lesion, not multiple lesions. Single lesions so can be targeted. Two lesions. Two lesions. How much less than three? Yes. They are less than three. So Oligometastatic. Oligometastatic. So can be given. Okay. So Harsh, what is your opinion about the not to give RT or to start the, the therapy? Patient is symptomatic for brain mass. First, I'll try to start uh, go ahead with RT and then continue to start uh, work up for systemic therapy and start systemic therapy on patients. So, you SBRT? Yes, sir, SBRT. Well. So, suppose patient, uh, after the five days of the SBRT, patient came to in the emergency with the, some seizures. So, how you will address that? So the seizures most likely will be of uh, post due to post RT edema. So I'll start uh, on that some phone manicure and uh, just to document I'll uh, do a imaging, brain imaging, MRI preferably, probably, and start on anti epileptic Actually, brain imaging is not required at this point of time because it is it is just because of the RT induced edema. SBRT has a high fraction of the radiation. So it causes uh, difficult edema and sometimes the seizures are there. So we need to address with the decongestive measures and uh, further continue with your systemic therapy. So are you which kind of systemic therapy you are advising to the patient? So we would uh, start the patient uh, flexibly on TKIs and this patient since uh, she has a she has brain mix. We would uh, prefer also more than that if she's affording since it has CN penetration. So how how many uh, the uh, TKI against EGFR do you know, uh, Doctor Venkatesh? Yes. In so total, first generation, second generation, third generation. First generation erlotinib, jeftinib. Set, yeah. uh, set, uh, then we have dacometinib in the second generation. Second generation is not dacometinib. So. Fatinib? Ah, Fatinib. Yeah, then? Then the third generation, Osimertinib. Then EGFR 20, exon insertions, which acts a uh, few drugs, uh, uh, monoclonal antibody, Mivantinib, Mobosetinib. So you want to start with Osimertinib, right? Yes. So what in the, uh, instruction you will give to the patient, which what is the dose of the Osimertinib, and from where they will procure the drug? Oh, ATMG OD, what is the uh, I'll start, sir. Before that, I'll work up. Uh, I'll go for ECG, QD echo, ECG. I'll just check for QT, prolonged QTC interval, waistline QTC. 
procuring uh, if they are affordable, we will go for uh, otherwise on patient compassionate, patient assisted program. So any drug which you want to avoid with the osimatinib or instruct the patient not to have the drug? PPA drugs or some. PPA drugs doesn't have any interaction with the osimatinib. But as Dr. Mansi has presented in her presentation, uh, this hydroxy uh, chloroquine, which has a QT prolongation if given with the uh, osimatinib. So this is to be remembered. It was learning, learning for us also. And uh, you will give osimatinib ATMG. So uh, which kind of the food instruction you will give? Yeah, no relation with food, sir. No. Okay, it can be taken any, any hour of the day or with or without the food. So, uh, earliest uh, when the response will become or you are expecting the response with the osimatinib. At what time frame there will be a response with the osimatinib? So sometimes patient relative may ask you, kya hone wala hai? patient kab thik hoga ya kab improvement hoga? So, you need to know that. Harsh, any, any insight about this? You can even take, generally take Comparatively more time than chemotherapy, so it will take around one to two months for. We are not discussing chemotherapy right mm -hmm. now. You tell us about the osimatinib uh, when the first response will come. It might come. First response may come within one to one or two months. We will we'll assess the response after generally after three months. Okay, four to eight weeks are the eight weeks is the cutoff for the response. Maximally patient gate. Till that time, you need to support the uh, brain mates or their uh, symptoms with your decongestive measures, sometimes anti epileptics or some other measures, metabolically correction of the calcium, magnesium, whatever is there. So, that is there. Yeah, now uh, suppose uh, what are the other options apart from TKIs? I mean, what are the combinations also which are approved? This first thing. We can give chemotherapy plus. Jacketinib, if the patient is not affordable, uh, we can give uh, private tissue carbo plus Sorry? Uh, time with PAM carbo plus JEP mm. combination we can start. Mm. It has shown to be equally efficacious to osimatinib. And uh, what about if it is an L858R? What type of response do you expect from osimatinib if uh, that was the mutation? So, even for L85R, osimertinib is a drug of choice. It is proven superior to single in Japitinib. Yeah, but are there some other options which have shown uh, slightly better results, though not in a head-to-head uh, -head comparison with osimertinib, but in their studies, so which have been you know spoken about? In L5, Apatinib has been compared, compared to, I'm not sure about that. Damisulimab with erlotinib combination or Davacizumab combination also is shown somewhat. Yeah, and what about Decomatinib? It has Decomatinib. Decomatinib also. Yes. Yeah. Not as good as Osmatinib, but Decomatinib is also shown. So what about if you have uncommon mutations? Affamatinib is, uh, uh, of course, Osmatinib also works, now, but three uncommon mutations like Yes, seven, six, eight, I is there are three mutations which are affirmative is a recommended. If not, then osimertinib also works on. This. Okay. Though erlotinib also works a few, but not good response as affirmative. Affirmative is up to. So, any instruction about the side effect of the drug, which you, the patient needs to observe or uh, have an idea before starting the therapy, you want to instruct the patient family members with osimertinib. So, mainly rash or the area could be not so common, but rash is one thing, sir. And regularly, we have to monitor the ECG for QTC prolongation and sometimes bradycardia. Thrombocytopenia. Rash is the commonest side effect. Skin dryness and rash is the commonest side effect. And uh, sometimes patients may have diarrhea also, but it's very rare with osmotomy. So, how we should deal with the rash problem or the uh, skin dryness and all that. Any advice you want to give? Anything more than grade 3 or 4, we have to hold temporal. Yeah. Grade 2, we can uh, observe once it is improved, either go for dose reduction or at the same level as per the tolerance. Grade 3 or 4, we have to discontinue. Not.
And for time being, you can say like uh, withhold the drug, but uh, generally grade three, grade four skin rashes are uncommon with the osmotanins. Grade two, uh, there are very uh, high number of the patient will have. So emollients and the, the preventive measures they can handle. Okay. So uh, regarding the PMJF and uh, carboplatin, which which component of this pro protocol is giving the equal results to control the brain mats? Pamitrin said carboplatin and japitinib. This is a very good protocol. And so we are saying like it is equivalent, almost equivalent to the osmotanib to controlling the brain mass. So amongst the, what is the component which is controlling brain mass? Brain mass? The carboplatin, which is penetrating into the brain and controlling the max. If jeftinib is the case, then why the osmotanib is superior than the jeftinib? So, go ahead. Uh, which kind of treatment you have given to your patient? Uh, so, so uh, this patient received fractionated SRS uh, to both the regions, 27 grain 3 fractions, and then following that was started on osmotanib. Okay, so, what is the follow-up of the patient? Is she doing well? Uh, so, she's due for first follow-up. No? Not yet. Okay. So, what is the timeline that you would uh, following up this patient and what are the investigation of choice? You would do MRI separately at every single follow-up or you would do MRI only at one month, three months? When will you do PET CT? So, what is your follow-up protocol for this patient? Uh, we could do MRI initially uh, at three months, and uh, uh, in the first two years, we would do an MRI three to four monthly, followed by six months uh, after two years. The uh, HCT uh, maybe at three months, and then uh, uh, CT imaging every three to four months. So, what is your idea, Harsh? Uh, when you will follow this patient? Which investigation you will advise at a minimum? So I, I'll ask the patient to come back after three months and do a routine CBC biochem and ECG, a lipid profile and HB1C. And then I'll, I'll do a response scan with CECT. Uh, 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 why HB1AC? Yes, sir. HB1AC, why you don't do you want to do this? HB1AC? Osimatinib, is there any risk for the metabolic syndrome or uh, uh, diabetes? No, Osimatinib does not. So, examiner will always ask in the exam why you have done this investigation. So, before speaking, you just think about suppose sometimes you say, like, we do the calcium, magnesium, and as an investigation. So, the pertinent to the drug, we should do the investigation. So, HB1S is not required. And, and do a response scan with CCT thorax and abdomen and MRI brain to look at the She had done the uh, PET CT uh, uh, in the investigation while she was working up. So, will you compare with the PET CT or will you do the CT scan? We can compare with PET CT also. We can do, uh, we, we can go ahead with CT scan also. PET CT in every visit is not required. Not every visit, but in the first yeah. visit. You want to see the response of the drug also. Yes. CT scan is a morphological scan in the black and white. So you don't know how what is the activity going on in the tumor tissue. So PET CT will be uh, advisable in this patient because we are targeting the lesion. And if there is a response, we can see further uh, do or not to do. Right. What about the scanning of uh, brain? At three months, I'll, I'll do an uh, I'm contrast, uh, C contrast and MRI. Yeah, for first, first visit is okay to do the MRI. Otherwise, you will do when the symptom will appear or anything, any problem or anything happens to the patient regarding the higher mental function or some uh, symptomatology is there to indicate to do the brain imaging. Otherwise, not. Yeah. And what you will see in the brain MRI if you have done the MRI? Because question is post uh, SBRT. So uh, we'll see this uh, necrosis uh, 
around the lesion with no with no perigesion in the mouth. They will ask to how the necrosis appear in the MRI. Which scan you will see? D one or D two? I'm not sure about the MRI. On the T2 images, they will see like the hypo intense lesion if the necrosis happened, and we will see there is there any new lesion which appeared uh, in the duration of course. Otherwise, we will not do the MRI again. Do once the patient has symptoms. Right. So suppose you have given the osimertinib for 18 months or maybe 12 months, and now the patient has uh, started having the symptoms of progression and. How you will uh, look at the case in this scenario? So, uh, and repeat the biopsy from the lesion that has increased in size and send it for NGS. Uh, if the patient is symptomatic, I'll start him on chemotherapy. If patient is not symptomatic, I'll wait for NGS report and based on that, I'll decide for my further treatment plan. Doctor Vikas, what you will do if the, there are some suggestion of progression clinically? Clinically, I'll, if he's having symptomatic, if he's symptomatic, I'll go for chemotherapy. And but I'll do a biopsy and I'll go for uh, and I'll send for molecular testing. And I'll first, you will do some scans to confirm oh, the problem. response. Scan. I mean, I'll first go for scan, sir. Which scan? Uh, PET CT. Yeah. Uh, then, if he's symptomatic for brain, again MRI brain. Uh, then I'll go for if a feasible biopsy. If there's a new lesion, I'll try to target the new new lesion if he's access feasible for biopsy. Any new lesion? So suppose patient is controlled in the brain, centrally controlled disease. Lung is also controlled. Patient has developed the new lesion in the liver. What you will do? That? I'll go for liver biopsy. What you will do with the biopsy? I'll send for NGS. Uh, what reason you will do that? Sir, you, why you will do the NGS on this uh, lung bi liver biopsy tissue? So probably any new mutation or uh, any other resistant mutation, resistant mutations which are come new new mutations which could be targetable. How the osimertinib resistance appears? Uh, by uh, tentacle pathways, which are uh, multiple pathways. Uh, one is uh, okay, one is the resistance. Second is second uh, reason why you will do the biopsies. What? Whether it's not a new primary or maybe new primary or maybe the uh, the sure. adenocarcinoma has changed its histology and Heterogen. sometimes there are five to fifty percent chances that patient may convert it into the non small cell. So small cell. I so you will do the biopsy. Right. What are the types of progression that you see? I mean, you are doing a PET scan. So, what is important? Like, what type of progressions do you see when you are a patient is on care? Normal progression. One is hyper progression. So no, is it? So you want to know whether it's one side progression or there are multiple sides of progression. So does that affect your decision on how you would manage this patient? Whether it's just one side progression or it is multiple sides of progression? Yes. If it is single side, we can target that with the local treatment. Followed actually, if it, and uh, we can continue treated till then. Meanwhile, we can continue the with with local therapy. If it's liver targeting liver, that lesion with either taste or some high, high interventional treatment, followed by continuation of same thing, or totally change the treatment menu. And uh, single lesion or multiple lesion depends on the, whether it's feasible for any local therapy. Next question. Yeah. Okay. Do we have the yes, other one more thing? Okay. So we, we were thinking like it's so one case. So we have second case. Yeah. Next case, please. So on progression, you just look at uh, whether we can handle this progression. Locally, or we need to give the systemic therapy or change the drug. So suppose patient was you. You just I'm just trying to patch up the time lag. So if it is a CNS control disease and uh, control in the primary side, we may address with some local therapies also. Or there was some uh, bone mats. We can give local RT. Here we can do the local ablative procedures or sometimes uh, uh, tear and tear, and then see what happens to the patient. 
then we might continue or we should continue the osimatinib because centrally it is controlled the risk and we may aid the further things like dr akhilas presented earlier we can aid the uh, bevacizumab type uh, protocol or sometimes we can uh, use the other chemotherapy also second yes sir yes. finished so 51 year old male from madhya pradesh present with chief complaints of cough since 2 to 3 months and exertion shortness of breath uh, since 1 month that's the chief complaints so coming to the present illness cough since 2 to 3 months predominantly dry cough and no postural variation or nocturnal variation and no aggravating or relieving factors and also complaints of loss of appetite with weight loss about 3 to 4 kg in past 3 to 4 months non significant and exertion is near uh, non progressive since 1 month it's not progressing say so mmrc 1 break Then no PND or wheeze, uh, or perhaps even nocturnal dyspnea or wheeze, no chest pain or fever, and no hemoptysis. So past history, no history of any uh, tuberculosis, and no diabetic since eight years on OHS uh, or oral uh, hypoglycemic, and no hypertensive bronchial asthma, and no previous surgeries or procedures in the past. So is a tobacco chewer since twenty years, and bowel and bladder habits are normal, and sleep and sleep is normal, and treatment history only OHS for diabetes mellitus, and apart from that, no previous. In treatment histories or any intervention procedures under. So coming to the summary, 52 year old male, diabetic, present with chronic dry cough and loss of appetite with exertion of breathlessness of grade one since sorry, uh, two to three months. Sorry. So you tell us uh, what is the meaning of uh, diurnal variation in the cough? What does it, it indicate? Uh, some uh, uh, nocturnal. Uh, Cough sometimes patient is on lying down some uh, uh, G R D some dry cough sir because it's down to dry cough G R D or sometimes more than no, that, no. bronchial asthma or something. yeah bronchial asthma and bronchial asthma so if the cough is in very late in the night patient was sleeping and suddenly gets up no problem cardiac and, issue so it is a cardiac early morning like three or four o'clock when the patient just get up and has the wheezing all that that is the respiratory illness. Yes. And uh, which type of the cough is more in the data? So usually they are the infectious sort of cough, and in night it is the because of the systemic involvement of the organs they are appears in the night. So you have mentioned, so I asked. So what is your differential diagnosis for these things? So because it's a two to three months the long stand, long standing, and no other with exertion, uh, shortness of breath, or uh, patient. I don't know. This is probably first time I got malignancy, sir. Next remote was box no sir. But you say dry cough was there. Dry cough. So dry cough is more in favor of the malignancy rather than the yes. some infection. Okay, go ahead. The work of part. So coming to examination, patient is conscious oriented. If he breathes and pulse is regular, eighty six per minute. And all peripheral pulses are felt, and blood pressure is normal, one twenty by eighty millimeter right arm supine so position. Respiratory twenty four. Uh, uh, saturation 98 percent and no paler ictus edema clubbing or cyanosis but there is left supraclavicular lymph node palpable about two centimeter which is non tender and skin over the node is normal uh, and JVP is not elevated nicotine stains are present on lips and teeth. Echo of one uh, and on systemic examination respiratory upper respiratory tract systemic examination normal and inspection chest is symmetrical cylindrical shape tracheas in midline and respiratory movements are equal. No sense of volume loss and epical impulse is not seen on inspection. Palpation, all inspiratory findings are confirmed. And inspection, no dilated veins or scars, and no issues of any accessory mold. Percussion, resonant note is heard in all areas, and no cardiac cardiac dullness is felt. So, no auscultation, bilateral air entry is present and equal, and no wheeze. And other systemic examination is within normal limits. Cardiac and abdominal and CNS. So, coming to the final, somebody fifty-two year old male with chronic cough and exertion dyspnea. And on examination, supraclavicular lymph node is palpable, and normal other examination findings. So my first possibility now will be malignancy. Then proceed for the workup part. So these are before coming to data. These are the investigations which are done outside, sir. So uh, the CT thorax is done, and it showed a left lower lobe mass uh, with mediastinal nodes, ipsilateral uh, paratracheal, prevascular subcranial, and contralateral paratracheal nodes, and widespread. Infective changes, but no obvious other meds. And bronchoscopy is also done outside, which cytology is from endobronchial growth, suspect adenocarcinoma. With these reports, he has presented to TAPTA. And in in TMH, uh, hemoglobin is fifteen. To total count of twelve thousand five hundred. Platelets of four lakh fifteen thousand. Creatinine point nine. Sodium one thirty nine. Albumin is four point three. 
and other lft is normal 2d echo is normal and calcium is also normal so so imaging was done pet ct so it showed a, a peripherally enhancing central necrotic soft tissue mass noted involving the lower lobe of left lung about 5 cm and also metabolically active ill defined interceptal thickening noted in the both lobes of left lung associated with one lung nodule in upper lobe likely disease reload and also metabolically active left pleural deposit and pleural thickening and hypermetabolic uh, mediastinal supraclavicular and retropatellar nodes are also seen. so this is the histopathology report uh, supraclavicular lymph node biopsy which is the metas adenocarcinoma of primary pulmonary origin and i uh, and the molecular markers alk is positive egfr negative pdl1 is negative and ros is negative so my final diagnosis is metastatic adenocarcinoma of lung with nodal pleural deposits alk positive diabetes mellitus okay so we have done supra clavicular node biopsy right and sent for isc by alk by isc yes okay and you have started on the alectomy yes Okay, very good. Then, so then response scan are uh, done uh, in uh, uh, after six three months. So mild decrease in the size of uh, primary, but in the March scan which was done, small uh, GG was new onset uh, ground glass opacities are seen. Opacities uh, are seen. Then again, the repeat scan is done uh, in uh, June, which showed increasing ground glass opacities. Sir. which is the lower scan which showed an increase in ground glass opacity as compared to pre and and apart from that on regular follow up patient had few issues indirect hyperbilirubinemia is increased bilirubin has gone up to 2.6 and indirect 2.2 and astlt are normal baseline bilirubin was 0.83 and grade 2 rash skin rash uh, of the legs which has improved with antihistamines drugs and drug induced lung injury suspected what could be the drug induced lung injury the new onset gg was And USG was done, uh, uh, which is normal, great to fatty liver, and core antigen is negative. LDH is normal. Bal was uh, bronchoalveolar lavage analysis was done. We showed uh, cytology epithelial cells, few pulmonary macrophages, and culture gene Nielsen staining, galactomain, fungal culture and gene expert are negative. So, what is the attributable feature for DGOs uh, in the lung? So, what are the attributable features or causes for the DGOs in the lung. Uh, uh, one thing is a drug induced. Sir. The other thing could be the disease progression. The other thing could be the infective etiology. Yeah, so, if the malignant disease is progressing, they will not give the DGOs. Ground glass opacity. It is because of some infection or some uh, toxicity which is affecting the parent. Uh, you, you can see the parenchymal things, interalveolar septas. They are just broadened up, and then they are looked at the DGOs. so infection you have ruled out yes. uh, fungal infection were not there tb was not there and uh, uh, bacterial infection were not there so it is most common cause of this is uh, tki which we yes. have used alectinib so you tell us uh, what are the chances of having the patient l positivity in the lung cancer about 5% nsc lcr for could be possibly positive for ns l 5 to 8% okay and uh, you have chosen electronic any specific reason for that uh, actually uh, not as such but as per the prior uh, trials which you have no uh, the first the trial uh, came out for the electronic it was cryotinib so you have left the cryotinib chosen the electronic what is the specific reason for that I think as I said, just so in other words, what is the big difference between the quetiapine and the electinib? Uh, about thirty-five. Uh, uh, Arshu, please help the pancreas. Yes. Is there any big difference between the electinib and the quetiapine? Yes, sir. Uh, so about so fifty percent uh, PFS with with electinib and thirty percent. Sorry, thirty-four months with the electinib and eleven months uh, with PFS with the quetiapine. No, the for the simple way, the electinib has a Higher age because it controls CNS is very well and this quetiapine doesn't control much. So this is the reason why why we have chosen this. And what are the basic side effect which can bother you while treating this patient with the electinib? Common side effects are hyperbilirubinemia, hyper, uh, 
metabolic metabolic features are possible to say then even bradycardia do you like to do any other imaging in the baseline evaluation apart from the pet scan especially in case of alp positive lung cancer same thing actually the sir has brain imaging brain imaging so right now it is in guideline for any uh, metastatic lung cancer you do it in baseline at least for alp you need to write in sexual data what are the other drugs that are there that can be given in first line what are the indicated drug, recommended drugs alectinib brigatinib lorlatinib and what about serotinib and trisotinib Sir, the crizotinib is some specific reasons, but not uh, like first line. Sir, serotinib also. Serotinib is also there. Crizotinib doesn't have oh. any pain penetration, no. so that's why it works. So, uh, what are the common side effects you were telling? The liver dysfunction, hyperbilirubinemia, sir. That Alex also. And transaminitis also it was. Transaminitis, yes, sir. Yeah. Hyperbilirubinemia, transaminitis. So, so, what you will do for that? So, uh, as per the, uh, if transaminitis is about more than five, or bilirubinemia, to, uh, uh, and bilirubin is normal, we'll hold the drug till it comes below three times, and then we can restart with a dosing level of one one level reduced. So, usually, what is recommended is six hundred mg BD. So, we can start with four fifty with one dose level already. But if there is both transaminitis and bilirubinemia, hyperbilirubinemia, about three to five times, we have to change the drugs. That's not. Then that is one indication about transaminitis and bilirubin. Then if there is any pneumonitis of anything great, severe great, we have to stop the drug. The pneumonitis or ILD, interstitial lung disease. So suppose patient came to you after two months and they are complaining a very specific complaint that doctor, doctor, I have the bilateral lower limb edema and it is not going up. And in morning it is okay, but in the daytime or in the evening it is very much troubling to us, troubling to me. What should I do? So, alectinib has a very special side effect, or for that matter, crizotinib also. They have a tendency to damage the venous walls, so blood will not pump up properly, and patient will have the edema. And once your legs are up from the gravitational force, it will reduce. So, you need to reassure the patient that it will happen, but it is of not very some problem. So, okay, then go ahead. What you have done with this patient? Uh, suspected elective due to lung injury with this patient started on oral steroids. Sir. Then response scan post one month of stopping of electinib was done, which showed a near stable liver lesion. I mean primary, and uh, with reduced reduction of GGOs. The ground glass opacities have been reduced. So the final diagnosis would be metastatic adenocarcinoma of lung with nodal and pleural deposits, all caused to post elective induced toxicity in terms of hyperbilirubinemia, skin rash, and lung injury, and presently recovered. And disease status under stable condition. So for the plan, we have to go for stopping the drug and go for next generation. Hey, why you are stopping the drug? Lung injury. Okay, because of the lung injury, so not for the disease okay. status, just because yes. of the toxicity. Is plan to change the drug. So which drug you will uh, now call for? Next is lorlatinib. Okay. For if. Because patient is disease under stable control, so no need of emergency chemo till we procure the drug. So we can go for lorlatinib procurement and then observe till then and control the skin toxicity. Now all the results are as of now. And now the parameters will be the latest three days ago. Will be is point eight three sir. Latest. How to follow the first line therapies which are uh, uh, in use for alp positive. Which is the one which is uh, notorious for lung injury? You have lorlatinib, brigatinib, alectinib, serotinib, and trisotinib. So, which one is the one known? And that is why you know it was almost given up, but it's still in use. And you have to be very careful when you start the patient on that drug, especially from the point of view of lung injury. Brigatinib. Yes. And what about now? Uh, there are some patients who still have to go on crizotinib for, uh, you know, financial reasons. So, uh, what uh, sort of complaints can they come up with? You know, one of the complaints uh, that you have to uh, actually educate the patient about. Mm -hmm. 
do they uh, i mean do they sometimes need to go to the ophthalmologist you know that it can cause some visual uh, side effects color so blindness. color blindness so you know you, you have to educate the patient on that because even till today there are some patients who are on the resortinib because of various reasons what investigation will you do in the follow up of lorlatinib especially lorlatinib uh, uh, hyper metabolic disorders uh, so triglycerides lipid cholesterol profile is one important thing sir one more next common in the crown study which you got is neuro cognitive defects are one thing so neurological examination is one thing we have to do clinically important cognitive defects are more one of the one more dangerous side effect which could occur with lorlatinib and how do you manage the hypertriglyceridemia either uh, simvastatin pravastatin or rosuvastatin because it doesn't have much uh, interactions or not severe interactions with lorlatinib so either what we have in our with our setting rosuvastatin can be treated okay. we have one more case no, i just want to know like what are uh, these non metastatic manifestations in lung cancer are you aware of them like a patient has hypercalcemia as uh, cerebellar ataxia but you don't find anything no bone mats no uh, brain mats so what are they paraneoplasm so this was a very good interaction with you all people and you did very well and this was a nice session and for the egf for alk thank you much thank you examiner examiners and thank you presenters it was wonderful session we discussed two cases thank you thank you, thank you.